celebrating the Spanish Month Heritage. Um, we have a guest, like, guest speaker uh, who agreed to join with us and share with us his experience. We have Dr. Jaume Juan Carlos, and he's the Chief of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism, the Chair of the ProMedica Endocrine Section, Director of Clinical Center for Diabetes and Endocrinic Research, and the co-director of the MD-PhD program. Dr. Jaume is original from Buenos Aires, Argentina. He has studied medicine at the National University of Buenos Aires. He completed his postgraduate medical education, internship, residence, and surgery and internal medicine and fellowship at the University, university Hospital uh, the National University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and the State University of New York, uh, Albert Einstein of Medicine in New York. In a few minutes, Dr. Jaume will share with us his uh, travel uh, experience uh, from Argentina to this country in the United States. Before he joined the University of Toledo in 2014, Dr. Jaume had multiple positions in academia and as a clinician specializes in endocrine and diabetes. Dr. Jaume has participated in multiple committees, community service, national and international organizations. Additionally, Dr. Jaume mentors endocrine and research fellows, as well as PhD, graduate student. He has received many awards and commendations. He has a vast experience in teaching education and continue with his research and scholarship. Thank you, Dr. Jaume, for being here and share with us your experience. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. So, um, well, thank you for this invitation. And um, I'm really honored to participate on this event. Um, uh, you know, really humble to share my experience along this ride. Um, let me just put uh, some uh, presentation here for you to um, look at while I talk on this uh, subject. And um, hopefully you will be able to uh, see it now. And um, this is, let me see over here. This is a picture of the uh, downtown Toledo uh, um, uh, area, uh, concert series, summer uh, 2019, and uh, beautiful colors there. Hope to get back to this uh, next summer. <laughs> and um, I bring this picture with me whenever I, go and give presentations here and there, um, just to show uh, how beautiful the downtown area is. And the university, of course, is always on my uh, slides. Um, a very important point for this uh, uh, um, uh, event is that, you know, the seal of the University of Toledo has um, several things that call the attention of the Hispanic community. Um, uh, some um, flags here remind me of uh, uh, Barcelona and Catalonia's uh, uh, flag. But uh, most importantly, right here, it says coadyuvando el presente y formando el porvenir. So um, whoever put this uh, seal together, obviously we're thinking in Spanish, and uh, I'm very proud that the university took this as, as a seal. Anyhow, you know, our medical center, um, picture there, and um, um, the name of my presentation, uh, reflections and challenges are along this uh, journey. So I just wanted to give a, a broad uh, a picture of what uh, Hispanic doctors in America look like, uh, and, and I start with this title, you know, the U.S. need uh, more Hispanic doctors. And I said that because, you know, 
17,000, about 17,000 medical students will graduate uh, across the US um, uh, and, and begin their careers in, in, in medicine next year. And, and um, uh, seems like a large number, but um, the demand uh, in our country will not be met uh, with these graduation rates. Uh, the reality is that it's estimated by the end of the decade that a shortage of, of, shortage of, of 90,000 physicians will, um, will be among us. And, and one remarkable thing is that the, the profile of those receiving their degrees is increasingly homogeneous and, and exclusive. And um, particularly, you know, when, when it comes to Hispanics uh, and Latino doctors. I'm not saying this myself, this comes from a, a AAMC website. Despite the fact that Hispanics uh, make up to 17% or so of the U.S. population, um, there's only a fraction of physicians, uh, uh, Hispanic physicians on the uh, workforce. Um, actually, between 78 and 2008, so 30 years, uh, the percentage is 5.5, so about 935 for the 17,000 that I mentioned uh, to start. Uh, uh, of, of the physicians that are, um, are uh, Hispanic in origin. And while the number of Hispanic applicants to medical school has tripled over the same period of time, the percentage who graduate from medical school remains uh, stable. Uh, so it's not, it's not growing with the application rate. And um, still the explanation for this phenomenon has not uh, uh, been uh, Elicited. Anyhow, uh, this is uh, uh, the map of the Americas, and uh, just to show you a little bit uh, where I'm from, uh, this is just at the tip of the continent, uh, Buenos Aires. This is Toledo, and here you have uh, the distance in uh, miles, uh, 5,500 miles, or by plane, 15 hours and 20 minutes quite a bit. Um, so it's, yes, a faraway land. Uh, I was born and raised in Buenos Aires. And um, this is a recent picture actually from um, uh, March uh, of uh, downtown Buenos Aires. Looks very quiet uh, because uh, it's during this uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, usually these uh, streets are very crowded, uh, lots of traffic in there, but uh, not these days. Um, I went to medical school, as mentioned by Carolina, uh, University of Buenos Aires. And this is uh, uh, a picture of uh, my humble uh, 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 beginnings on, on the uh, uh, Facultad de Medicina um, in, in Buenos Aires, uh, the only state uh, um, uh, university uh, there. So we study medicine from um, different books that, um, as you can see, have a common theme. Um, they are uh, uh, written uh, by um, American doctors. And um, um, Harrison's Medicine Interna, Internal Medicine, Pathology, Pathologia Humana from Robbins, and Guyton, uh, physiologia with, with, with an, a, a, an F um, are, are the uh, 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 medicine we, we are taught, uh, which, you know, from my, uh, you know, early beginnings made me think that um, medicine is made in the USA. Um, even, even these days when you are uh, following international news on cable, you get to see some famous uh, names uh, that uh, write those those books, uh, Dr. Fauci there. So, um, always being impressed by 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 this uh, uh, situation, I was uh, um, always you know intrigued by by um, um, why medicine was being made in the United States. Uh, but was not just that when I think about why. 
I decided to come this way. Um, one year, one year before my graduation from medical school, I there was an event that I think um, uh, really changed my my life, and that was the um, Nobel Prize award to uh, Cesar Milstein. So. Um, Cesar uh, Milstein was awarded in 1984 his uh, Nobel Prize uh, in Physiology or Medicine jointly with his uh, postdoctoral fellow, uh, George Keller. And, and uh, this was because of the discovery of the monoclonal antibodies and uh, the development of the technique of the um, uh, hybridoma, uh, uh, which, which is you know, meant to be for the production of these uh, biologicals. Um, that event, obviously, for, for an Argentinian was uh, uh, remarkable and uh, made me think um, a little bit about um, um, uh, research and uh, research outside Argentina. Uh, uh, Dr. Milstein graduated from Buenos Aires, originally from Bahia Blanca, Argentina, and, and uh, did his discoveries in uh, in in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, so I have to say that research uh, was was the reason uh, for for um, uh, this um, for 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 my relocation to to the United States. And um, I know it's a cliche, and but I I'm going to try to prove you that that's why I'm here. Um, so um, for my postgraduate uh, training, I started in a research laboratory in uh, Stony Brook in New York. And, and um, there was a connection, obviously, between what I was doing in, in Buenos Aires just after I graduated and, and, um, and this uh, research laboratory. But um, that was my first step. And uh, within, within a short period of time, um, I, 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 you know, was able to secure a position in the residency training uh, right, right the following year on the same university. Um, uh, uh, the truth was that there was a lot of work in between um, uh, and, and um, you know, that, that work led me all the way to the uh, final stage of the residency at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, so we, within the first uh, six months, uh, and, and as I said, um, uh, working on a research laboratory, we were able to put together um, a couple of uh, uh, presentations that later on became publications and really opened the door for me uh, to move uh, along the way on this um, uh, uh, career in, in medicine. And so um, I... I titled the presentations there that made me move into the residency and, and, um, uh, and, and more work that I was doing while, while being an, an, an intern uh, in, in surgery that helped me move along to the um, uh, position in the residency training at, at Albert Einstein. Um, uh, Dr. Rosner here happened to be uh, the, um, uh, uh, the chair of medicine for the department there in Albert Einstein and was really uh, um, uh, a key uh, uh, collaborator for, for um, these things to happen. So I have to say that, you know, research uh, counts um, uh, when, when you're trying to move through your career. Um, and, you know, the decision to go into uh, my subspecialty, which is endocrinology, uh, was really from from my heart. I, I always liked the subspecialty of endocrinology uh, from from medical school, and um, and and um, just happened to be that in the United States uh, that subspecialty was not uh, very competitive. Uh, lucky me. Um, I, I you know and and I make space for this slide here because I wanted to show you how the distribution of these subspecialties happened to be when you uh, look at the um, Hispanic uh, doctor population. So this is from 2018, again, you know, the AAMC uh, website. Um, and, and as you can see here, I highlighted in, in um, yellow my subspecialty endocrinology. 
um, which um, in 2018 produced 224 uh, uh, Hispanic uh, specialists uh, as opposed to the uh, 2048 um, uh, white doctors um, practicing in endocrinology. Uh, the difference there is, you know, about 10 times, it's less than 10, 10 times. So what I decided to do is highlight in red all those uh, specialties in medicine in which there is uh, more than 10 times of, of a difference. And uh, as you can see, uh, many subspecialties of medicine have that kind of uh, ratio. So the uh, Hispanic versus white is uh, more than 10 times. Some of them are even uh, uh, really, really uh, ahead. Uh, you know, if, if you think on the um, uh, white doctors versus versus uh, Hispanic doctor side. So ophthalmology, for example, has 20 times more um, uh, doctors uh, that are non-Hispanics. Uh, orthopedics, 30 times, and uh, um, ENT, uh, 25 times. So we need to uh, encourage any way we can uh, 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 more Hispanic doctor to move into these uh, subspecialties. Um, as, as you can see, there is a, a very clear need. Um, just, just you know, for, for fun, I, I, I uh, highlighted here OBGYN in which Hispanic doctor seems to be, you know, at least ahead of Asians and in, in, a, in a kind of a good uh, ratio, favorable ratio. So, so I don't know why is that, but uh, uh, seems to be a good trend uh, there. I wish all subspecialty would behave this, this way. Anyhow, I, I chose um, uh, um, endocrinology and set myself to uh, a, a fellowship that uh, moved me from New York all the way to San Francisco, another big, big trip. Um, I, I became a, a fellow there in 91 in the endocrinology and metabolism uh, training program at the University of California in San Francisco. And, and um, I moved from there to another, uh, um, I would say, fellowship, um, which I, I, I really uh, um, uh, compete for, um, and, and um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of being a graduate from the Molecular Medicine Training Program at UCSF. Uh, in the year 94 was the second year of the fellowship, and I was the first MD uh, um, graduate to join the fellowship. This was primarily a PhD uh, uh, track fellowship. So, but I, you know, again, wanted to emphasize that um, uh, there was some work in between us, as you, you can see, um, um, if anything was a very, very productive uh, um, uh, set of time for me and uh, was able to uh, come up with um, publications, uh, obviously from my mentor, uh, 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 laboratory, uh, Dr. Rappaport, uh, those days, but, but you know, a major effort in order to go from uh, um, uh, the, the uh, clinical fellowship to this um, highly competitive research fellowship. So, so I have to say once again, you know, research uh, rules. Um, you have to have this in your curriculum. You have to have this uh, uh, um, uh, sort of, of uh, um, uh, uh, help and training in order uh, to to move forward, I, I think you know research definitely rules. From from my uh, fellowship, my, my I, I went to my my first uh, job here, and um, was you know, lucky to be recruited by uh, the same university. The uh, UCSF uh, uh, um, uh, gave me the opportunity of, of becoming an adjunct assistant professor uh, right after my um, second fellowship. And I uh, move along uh, on, on my career uh, there in San Francisco uh, for um, my first uh, 10 years of uh, postgraduate, again, with a lot of work. Uh, so um, I just joined here uh, the um, uh, effort to have um, these uh, junior grants that um, allow me to uh, continue with the research line and, um, and, and you know, to, to be able to uh, participate in these academic activities that uh, foster my, my um, uh, 
a, a middle career, if, if you wish. Um, so 10 years there, and um, I have to say that, you know, research pays because, again, um, there was uh, um, some money involved, obviously, from, from this uh, research grant that uh, helped me uh, move forward. So um, the decision was made uh, to settle somewhere in the Midwest. And I show you here my move from San Francisco to um, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, we said time to settle down, maybe. I, um, uh, I, I haven't mentioned that um, uh, I'm married with uh, 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 um, a nephrologist, and uh, she's a um, uh, faculty also here at the University of Toledo. Um, uh, Maria Alejandra uh, Jaume has been um, with me all this time and uh, actually working together in many of these, these projects. Uh, the decision was made to move to Madison, Wisconsin, where I was uh, given the position of assistant professor um, on the uh, tenure track back in 2003. And um, uh, I was given a dual appointment, mostly because of the research I was doing in the cellular and molecular pathology department, and uh, move along the research career there together with the uh, uh, clinical opportunities that the VA in Madison provided. So I became the chief of the section there and the director of the um, multidisciplinary clinic. Um, uh, a job that really loved, you know, I became associate, associate uh, program director for the uh, fellowship. Uh, and, and uh, but I, I, I just became associate professor ten, uh, uh, se seven years after. And um, I wanted to emphasize this uh, uh, timing because it was a long timing, you know, by, by any means, um, the um, academic clock was a seven year clock at uh, UW Madison. So I just made it to the, to the tenure position uh, by 2010. So um, again, uh, uh, lots of work was involved. I would say that uh, research uh, uh, promotes. And, and the reason I said that is because uh, 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 although I moved to Madison with too much money to spend, uh, 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 it was only when I was able to renew my senior uh, grant. This uh, VA merit is considered a senior grant, uh, R01 equivalent. Only when I was able to renew that grant was, I, was the time I was considered for that uh, promotion. So, so clearly uh, um, uh, the research is needed and, um, and if um, these promotions are to happen, um, the, the uh, continuation of research is, is, um, is, is really a big consideration. Um, and, and again, I wanted to show you some figures for um, um, diversity in medicine and uh, associate professorship, which is you know, a critical point in the career of any academic uh, uh, doctor. And, uh, moving from uh, non-tenure to tenure is, is a big step. Unfortunately, um, uh, as you can see here, 3.2% uh, of professor, associate professors in, in this country in 2018 um, are from the uh, Hispanic origin. So, so um, lots of work needs to be done there. Um, uh, and, and as I said, um, uh, promotions are, are very important and um, and research is a huge component on those on those uh, promotions. So uh, again, um, still in in Madison, um, I became my program director uh, for the fellowship, and uh, that was and it still is uh, a job that uh, I enjoy uh, uh, greatly, and and um, I was able to continue this task. Uh, when the next move came, which now was uh, not so so long, I mean, in distance at least, uh, 390 miles, I moved to uh, Toledo, um, Ohio. And uh, yeah, we were thinking about this, time to rest. Uh, we have worked hard uh, all along, so maybe 
maybe um, this was the place to do so, but, um, uh, you know, uh, we have another task to uh, bring about uh, a division. The truth uh, said is that in 2014, the Department of Medicine uh, had only one uh, um, um, emeritus professor about to retire uh, when I when I joined. So, so I became the chief and the Indian uh, at the same time. Uh, so um, uh, I, I had a big task of recruiting and putting together this uh, division. Uh, together with that, um, the clinical directorship of uh, the Center for Diabetes and Endocrine Research was another big thing on my shoulders. And and um, and and you know the the year after that the the um, uh, co-directorship for the uh, MD PhD program came all about. So so um, uh, these were really uh, full-time jobs uh, um, combined, and and um, uh, there was not not really uh, time to rest. Um, so I moved. Forward on, on, on the career, the um, basic science director uh, left, and um, by default, I became the director of the center, uh, which I still uh, are, and um, were able to put together a fellowship, uh, ACGME approved fellowship in 2016. Um, uh, the fellowship uh, first class started in 2017, and um, uh, the affiliation. Uh, provided me also with the opportunity of uh, carrying over the uh, Division of Endocrinology to the uh, um, uh, ProMedical Health System, which uh, now uh, um, we, we um, are uh, settled in. Um, and, and again, by default, uh, the, my co-director left and I became uh, the full director of the, of the program um, a couple of years ago. Now, the chairman of the Department of Medicine is just by vote. I, I, I'm very proud of this one. Uh, I, I didn't uh, uh, do much uh, except for uh, uh, um, uh, listing myself and, and um, colleagues decided to make me the chair. So I have been in that position since 2019. And I said, no way to rest. Of course, no way. You, you've seen there was a lot to do. Uh, but, um, you know, research keeps on being the reason. Um, we had some help from the JDRF. Uh, obviously, the University of Toledo Startup Fund was a big, big uh, help on moving our research forward. And we have a couple of uh, foundations that help us out. And now, you know, as of uh, this year, mostly the um, state of Ohio came up with a big grant uh, uh, to push uh, diabetes, um, uh, uh, you know, quality improvement and care of patients from the um, uh, uh, med Medicaid side. So, so the research, you know, uh, uh, reason I think is obvious on, on this presentation. Um, um, I think it's a, it, it has been for, for me uh, um, the you know, a, a great way of uh, moving along the career and uh, and it provides me with the satisfaction I have from this uh, you know, endeavor, this, this uh, uh, daily uh, living um, uh, um, still. So so to, to the point that, you know, I, 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 I said I, I cannot help myself and I have to show you, you know, what we are doing these days. So So I hope you bear with me. And I'm gonna try to go fast on this one, but uh, I, I have to show you what you know uh, uh, the research is is uh, is doing at least on my side. So I said the best is yet to come. We keep on working hard, and over the last um, uh, I would say two years, uh, we file now uh, uh, two uh, applications for patents, and both of them have been granted. Um, we put a patent for the uh, spontaneous. Uh, animal model of type 1 diabetes that um, took us many years to come up with, and also uh, an, an immunotherapy that um, may be helpful for the treatment of diabetes um, in, in the research, in the recent, uh, uh, I mean, in, in the near future. So um, I'll, I'll fly through this and um, 
And as I said, I cannot help myself. I have my audience. So I, I, I'm going to talk about my research. Okay. <laughs> so here, here is um, something about the animal model of diabetes. Um, I, as you all know, th there are not good models uh, for um, this autoimmune uh, disease. Uh, um, and and, and uh, the ones available do not really carry uh, the human susceptibility and the primary antigens are, are, are not really known. So, so there is a need uh, for, this is just a slide of um, how the um, NOD mouth is not a good model. This paper was uh, in Nature Medicine uh, titled uh, the NOD mouse model of type 1 diabetes as good as it gets. Um, I highlighted here things that cure diabetes, 125 ways you can cure diabetes in the NOD mouth, even with things like overcrowding on, or, 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 or uh, elevating the temperature of the, the room by one degree. So this was recognized by NIH in 2015 as, as being you know, the best model, yet uh, not really predictive of, of, of uh, therapeutic success in humans. And, uh, and, and they emphasize the need for a new animal model that, that could really be used to predict um, uh, how uh, medications work and, and um, uh, how diabetes can be treated in, in a more reliable way. Uh, so an animal model in which the human beta cell, you know, the cell that makes insulin autoantigen present uh, 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 antigens uh, basically uh, in, in a system that may be more human um, uh, was, was uh, needed. And um, this would be highly desirable for studies of mechanism of disease and anti-immune intervention. So we did just that. We basically put together a transgenic model here by crossing an animal that had the susceptibility for type 1 diabetes uh, with another animal that carry a human autoantigen. The animals, you know, these uh, mice do not have human GAT65, do not have GAT65 at all. They have an isoform, the carrier uh, of this enzyme. Uh, so so um, the transgene is, is needed. And the combination of the two gave us this humanized model that now uh, 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 we know develops uh, autoimmune uh, diabetes. Um, uh, I, I, I uh, I have a picture here of uh, Dr. Imam, who has been a partner for years now in the development of this animal model. Uh, we uh, together collected um, uh, uh, generations of these animals and, and crossed them along the way with uh, an impaired fasting uh, glucose uh, um, strategy. So animals that had high glucoses were crossed uh, to the point that after those 30 generations, uh, founder was uh, uh, came up with, with a blood sugar of 366 which was diagnostic of uh, diabetes so that spontaneous animal was uh, living together in the same cage with other animals that did not have diabetes so obviously we um, um, uh, isolated that animal and started a new colony based on that one which uh, was glucose intolerant and um, uh, gave us you know by crossing uh, a new generation of mice that um, spontaneously develop diabetes. So this is the best proof I have for that. And um, I, I, I show here um, uh, immune cells. Uh, these are lymphocytes uh, of a diabetic animal uh, as opposed to a control animal. Uh, you see um, quadrants here that depict uh, specific immune cells. Here are T cells of the CD. Uh, eight kind and T cells of the CD4 kind, and I, I told you this is the best, the best uh, example I have for, um, for the um, uh, behavior of uh, uh, diabetes development in this animal model. Um, I can show you here that as we get closer to the pancreas, the populations uh, seem to be uh, changing uh, to the point in which, um, when you compare to the control, uh, the number of cells are, are, are much less and they become really homogeneous when we get into the pancreas in which um, only the diabetic animals happen to have those uh, CDA positive cells that are really pathognomonic of the disease. This is, this is how human diabetes happens. Uh, CDA positive cells that are antigen specific destroyed 
beta cells and uh, render patients insulin dependent. So um, again, you know, collaborator and uh, 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 Maria here show that these animals uh, develop the complications of diabetes, which is, a, you know, an indirect way of showing uh, the validity of the model. Um, these animals develop uh, the typical diabetic nephropathy. Um, and I, I'll show you here um, just how the creatinine uh, of a control versus um, type 1 diabetic animal looks like. Uh, they, they have proteinuria within the first uh, three months, uh, which gets worse by six months. And, um, you know, we were able to prove that the lesion, which is the typical lesion of the diabetic nephropathy in humans, is this enlargement of the basal membrane of the uh, uh, glomeruli. Uh, here you can see it's measuring 151 uh, uh, nanometers, becomes really enlarged uh, as it does in humans as, uh, as the first uh, manifestation of, um, of uh, diabetic ne nephropathy. So um, more pictures here just to prove that the kidneys uh, look like the ones from uh, humans. These are uh, four month old um, type 1 diabetic animals that are already developing the typical lesions of Kimmelstel Wilson um, in the glomeruli. And um, another picture here taken uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Guhara, who helped us on this uh, quite a bit. Um, of, of vacuolation within within uh, uh, kidney tubules is another typical uh, uh, lesion that is seen in patients that have uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, um, also happening in our model. So the uh, eye problem also carries, uh, you know, uh, 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 is carried by, by our animal uh, model. Here is um, uh, just to show um, uh, some um, uh, retinopathy, these are acellular capillaries that uh, you see only in diabetics with the disease, human, you know, uh, uh, and as well as mice. Um, more pictures here of the fundoscopic examination of the mice uh, with diabetes. As you can see, there are some uh, vascular leakage and uh, deposition of exudates, uh, which are really significant on the type 1 diabetic animals, um, optical coherence tomography, a sophisticated way of looking at the optic nerve with the, the diffusion of the macula. Again, a typical exam of the uh, human eye with diabetic uh, uh, retinopathy, proliferative retinopathy. Um, here we can see it in our mouse model. Even neuropathy is present. You know, there is a delay in conduction of uh, small nerves that is, is shown in this, uh, in this slide. So, I wanted to prove that, you know, we had a good model because we wanted to move into this story, uh, the um, treatment of diabetes. And I think this is, you know, the most important piece in, in my mind of uh, what we are doing today. Um, if anything uh, is, is uh, what I, as I said, um, uh, try to come up uh, for every day, um, uh, a way of uh, reverting the disease. And, um, uh, we did not discover this. Of course, this was discovered 1993 by a group in in um, in the uh, Weizmann Institute in Israel. Um, uh, Dr. Eshard uh, came up with this idea of combining an antibody binding domain with a T cell uh, receptor signaling domain. The idea was to make a hybrid cell which will trap antigen as a B cell and produce antibodies and, and uh, at the same time signal onto a T cell. Um, so creating this situation of um, a target specific cytotoxic T cell um, to destroy specifically uh, in this case, uh, cancer. This was the first paper published. Um, this is in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013, in which these uh, chimeric antigen receptor modified T cells um, uh, basically uh, uh, reverted the course of uh, two children that had relapsing uh, um, uh, refractory um, uh, um, uh, acute uh, uh, lympholeukemia and uh, with, with a, a life expectancy that was in month, we're able to uh, 
survive and uh, um, basically uh, became a cure of, of the condition. So these uh, chimeric antigen receptors um, were capable of uh, killing even you know aggressive uh, cancer uh, from from these patients with refractory uh, leukemia. So really a, a technique that we were much impressed and uh, became um, a very exciting uh, science title um, in, in 2019. This is by a, 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 a colleague of uh, you know, us in, in, in UCSF, Jeff Bluestone, put this um, editorial together as um, this, this uh, approach being uh, the next frontier of cell therapy. So here we are moving from you know, the biologicals into what is called now uh, adoptive cell therapies. And what he speculates is that the next generation of these immune cell therapies for uh, non-cancer of disease, specifically for the treatment of uh, type 1 diabetes, may be a, a, a very uh, good option. Uh, he you know, uh, um, expands there that uh, maybe this is a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, graft uh, versus host disease, transplants, and uh, maybe even Alzheimer, Parkinson's, heart disease, or type 2 diabetes. So, so what you can see is that you know, these adoptive cell transfer uh, 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 therapies may, may uh, uh, in, in the near future become um, uh, uh, a very important uh, uh, new um, way of, um, of um, attacking human disease. So uh, we went on to designing a, 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 a chimeric antigen receptor against our uh, target antigen. In this case, is the uh, glutamic acid decarboxylase 65 uh, enzyme, the, the target of the immune system for the disease. And the idea behind this was to create a cell that is regulatory, not, not cytotoxic, that is a cell that could reach the antigen and downplay the immune system at the site in an antigen specific way. So if anything, this is uh, antigen specific immunosuppressive therapy. And um, the design work, these uh, regulatory T cells were used um, uh, uh, in the past for the treatment of, um, of, of diseases, but the scarcity of the antigen specific T-Rex is what limits the, this kind of uh, medical approach when you work with naive cells. But if you were to make these uh, 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 cells as we did, then you would have a situation in which um, a CAR T regulatory cell can go on to binding the target and down regulating the uh, effector cells in the surrounding. So, um, uh, so, so that was how we designed our uh, next line of experiments. We created two different chimeric antigen receptor, uh, um, T-Rex cells, uh, GAT65 spe specific. One was meant to be for the membrane anchorage domain, the other one for a soluble domain. The idea was to be able to capture both soluble protein and membrane bound protein. And again, you know, I show you the results here. I'm, I'm sorry, but bear with me. We have two more slides here. Uh, um, I show you the response of the animal that were treated with the chimeras. Here you have one of them in blue. The control obviously is developing the diabetes. This is 30 days after the animals were treated with a small dose of these um, uh, CAR T-Rex cells. Um, the other chimera work even better. Uh, and the comparison here is when we give naive T-Rex cells, that is regulatory cells that are not specific for the antigen. So the response, you know, it, it was uh, really uh, remarkable. Uh, obviously, the visual here is for the uh, diabetic animal. So on top, you have the pancreas of an animal that has active uh, diabetes um, and, and the islet cells are missing. Uh, except for this one that happens to be highly infiltrated by the lymphocytes that will kill eventually the um, uh, uh, beta cells on that islet. When we treat with the chimeras, here is the chimera M and the chimera N, the islets seem to be uh, protected. Um, uh, we speculate that maybe they are rescued or, or there are new islets coming along 
Uh, we still have remaining islets that uh, are being killed, but um, these uh, protected islets provided the uh, glycemic control that I show you on the previous slide. Um, so we concluded, you know, after just 30 days of treatment that uh, the glucose tolerant test, as well as the insulin secretion test, um, significantly deteriorated in control groups with type 1 diabetes, except for the animals that we treated with the um, chimeras. Uh, this was the first time for a therapeutic approach to be successful on abrogating diabetes in our type, you know, in our type 1 diabetes mice. Uh, uh, but obviously, if, if um, uh, this works, uh, reco recovery and reconstitution of beta cells in humans uh, may, be, may be possible. Anyhow, we uh, just show you that there is a new animal model and it belongs to the University of Toledo um, and is available in our laboratory, resembles the human disease, uh, spontaneously developing diabetes. Um, the, um, all, all the diabetes complications happen in these animals. I'll show you just here the, uh, in the picture, the dry eye, the, you know, Sjogren syndrome that associated with type 1 diabetes. We see it in our mice too. Um, the the uh, killing of the beta cells is specific by CD8, which is the hallmark of the human disease. Uh, and, and therapeutic approaches that were, treat, were, were tried in, in NOD mice should, should now be, treat, be tried in, in our uh, um, spontaneous autoimmune diabetes model. Um, we put together a, you know, a, a very exciting uh, treatment option, which is this uh, GAT65 chimeric antigen receptor T cells to revert diabetes. And hopefully we can move forward on a phase one, two uh, trial as soon as we can get um, our, our uh, approval for an investigational new drug. This is how the trial you know, would look like. Basically, we uh, get blood from a patient with diabetes isolate the uh, PBMCs, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells with, you know, from 10 cc's of blood. The cells get modified uh, in the lab uh, and the CAR uh, uh, chimera is, is, um, is uh, built into those uh, regulatory T cells. The regulatory T cells get to be expanded and then shipped back to the patient who happens to get them uh, uh, infused at a later day. The process in general is about 20 days. Um, and, and, um, and as I said, it's being done for the treatment of cancer today. Uh, this is just the uh, speculation for, for a possible use in, in humans. All of this is being done in these uh, uh, two places, uh, the uh, Cedar Basic Science in, in the Health Science Campus and the Cedar Clinical Translational Center uh, right across from the Toledo Hospital in the Falzon Diabetes Center. And uh, I listed here you know, the collaborators that really help out uh, all along um, and uh, research uh, people as well as, um, as, as colleagues in the Division of Endocrinology. And I thank you at this time for your attention and open the forum for, for questions. Thank you, Dr. Foro, for your presentation. Very interesting. And uh, please, if anybody has any question, anything else to ask to Dr. John May, uh, feel free in this moment. Thank you so much for your, your talk this evening. Um, one of the slides you put on was um, um, really striking. And that was you know, the double AMC specialties where you look at 20 times more and 25 times uh, higher uh, in ophthalmology and, and uh, orthopedic surgery compared for whites compared to Hispanic uh, 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 presence in these specialties. Um, I have a question for you with all of your research, which is is so motivational and um, and, and just groundbreaking. How were you able to navigate all of these different spaces where you were likely, um, probably, I'm, I'm assuming, one of the only Hispanics in some of these, you know, uh, um, in some of these work research projects and in your work? How were you able to uh, maintain your confidence? How were you, were you ever 
in um, touch with mentors who really help to kind of boost your confidence in these um, in these spaces. Yeah, so um, uh, I mean, the good thing about the research is that um, data is being produced and uh, and it's very difficult to fight data. So um, so I, I think I mean, Again, my, my mentors really opened the door for me, and and um, and uh, I, I was uh, coached very closely for years. Uh, but but um, but the answer was always the same: uh, um, uh, you produce the data, you have the data, and things move forward. Um, so um, you know, I mean, it's. It's true, and maybe sometimes I felt uh, that uh, I wasn't uh, progressing as fast as others, uh, but I always blame it on myself. You know, I always thought that uh, uh, I need to do more. I have to, you know, uh, push forward. I have to uh, try once and again. Um, I, I remember, you know, my early days, the, uh, Dr. Rapa for telling me, you know, if you have one out of ten of the research, uh, uh, you know, experiments you are doing are going the way, you, you know, you, you like it to go, uh, you are very lucky. So so we were really I mean, set for failure, uh, you know, once and again, because uh, you knew that, uh, yeah, to, to, to get to the right spot, you needed to do it many, many, many times. So again, I feel that that's, that's the, is, is a key thing I would like to pass along. Um, uh, uh, you know what what you, what you do in the research field is probably what you need to do all along, and is be resilient, and uh, and 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 try again and again and again. And uh, uh, if things are too easy, are probably wrong. So so uh, you know I remember uh, driving seventy two times uh, because I know this because I have the experiment to prove it. Uh, from from UCSF to Stanford to use a machine there um, to do an assay, an IL-2 assay, the machine, you know, it was an ELISA, European ELISA apparatus that was not available in UCSF. So I had to drive to uh, uh, Stanford, it's, uh, you know, it was uh, 45 minutes when there was no commute uh, uh, time. And I remember going there 72 times to repeat the same experiment. Uh, so up until, up until we felt that, uh, okay, you know, it, it's probably uh, uh, right. So um, I could have dropped it, you know, but uh, uh, we, we felt that was important to do it and I kept on doing it. And sometimes that commute was 45 minutes, as I said, sometimes was three hours, but, um, but we, we, we did it and we ended up publishing it. And I think, again, uh, resilience is a big, big, big uh, component of all of this. I think for all of us, not just for Hispanics, but, you know, in general, I feel that, you know, as a minority, uh, uh, you, you, you should prove yourself twice. Um, you want to prove yourself twice. And every time you do it, um, you, you help, uh, you know, uh, others that are, um, uh, you know, on the same minorities. So, um, I mean, you you have done it too, okay? So I don't have to tell you, you know. But uh, but but uh, um, uh, I, I think you know we ought to do it. So that's the way I feel about it. That um, um, it's hard work, but um, um, we 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 ought to do it. I'm going to let other people ask questions, but I do have one other questions and question and, and hard work. And never giving up, you know, just rings through uh, your entire life's journey. I had the pleasure of meeting your daughter, who is wonderful and is in the incoming class this year. She's um, we're already proud of her. She's phenomenal. Um, but this this incoming class has one of the largest numbers of Hispanic uh, first year medical students. So, um, in addition to your advice and hard work and resilience, do you have any other words of encouragement for them, because uh, several of them are on the line tonight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, first thing is, you know, feel proud of yourself because this is a major accomplishment. And, uh, you know, you know, uh, I mean, you should look at these uh, statistics that I, I, I show 
uh, to prove the point um, is, is a major accomplishment. So feel, uh, um, uh, really feel uh, uh, yourself as a uh, as an overachiever because you made it. But that that uh, said, um, you have to keep on going. I mean, you know, it's a long journey, and and um, and uh, there may be bumps in in the road. Uh, 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 maybe 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 you know larger bumps than for others, and uh, you have to be ready for uh, that. And always, as I said, try to uh, make the best you can. It's not just um, uh, uh, for you, but for 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 the, your uh, uh, um, uh, you know colleagues, your um, you know uh, Hispanic friends and families, and uh, you are really representing a minority on everything you do. So um, so you know the um, the fact that. Um, uh, you have to go the extra mile um, is not anything but what you have been doing your whole life. So, um, so keep on going. That, that would be my, my, you know, advice. Keep, keep on going the same way you have done it so far. So I cannot see the um, audience, but I guess if uh, anybody wants to ask a question, we can. Please feel free to put your, um, if you're not able to um, verbally ask a question, if you can put your question in the chat box, we'll make sure we uh, let Dr. Home know. Susan, if you'd like to unmute yourself, I have you uh, as a panelist. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say thank you for um, speaking to us today. I know it's it's been a big problem for years, the underrepresentation of Latinos and Hispanic people in the um, medical community. I guess going forward, um, what kind of things do you think can be done to increase those numbers or what kind of things are already being done, in your opinion? As we enter practice, at least, how can we encourage younger people and help them find those avenues? Yeah. So. so um... You know, I haven't been in the administration much uh, to to uh, you know be able to you know put together a strategy. Um, I think you know, uh, I mean, obviously, a move forward for the University of Toledo, the College of Medicine, was the creation of the diversity office, and uh, we have no words, you know, for what Dr. Jenkins is doing. Um, uh, this was a serious, serious, you know, uh, uh, intervention. Um, um, led by by our dean, uh, Dr. Cooper, uh, but uh, but as I said, um, uh, I think if I had to plan a strategy, this is it. Uh, at least at the level of you know a, a medical school, um, you need to have uh, a sort of an office that is um, uh, really looking at all the aspects because it's not just the admission. Of, 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 of you know medical students, not just the review of applications, but um, uh, there is a whole uh, set of um, uh, uh, things that need to be uh, looked in detail uh, by by a diversity office, which is happening here. I mean, you know, if anything, uh, uh, this office is is writing the book uh, for for how to approach you know uh, um, diversity is is definitely needed. I mean. You know, uh, uh, I sit in my clinic, and and uh, you know, I get to see um, uh, the, the smile of patients that happen to be of a you know minority background when they realize you know the doctor that is seeing them is also in that minority background, not necessarily speaking the same language, uh, uh, or or um, uh, you know uh, needing to have any kind of uh, uh, overwhelming handicap. The, the reality is that um, uh, there is a connection that goes, you know, beyond the patient uh, uh, doctor relationship. Um, whenever, whenever you have this situation, so, so I think is 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 uh, beneficial um, uh, beyond statistics. Uh, uh, what what happens when uh, you produce uh, uh, minority doctors, 
and um, and and I hope you know, as I said, it's like the one that the University of Toledo College of Medicine put together with the diversity office are happening everywhere. I, I, I as I said, I wish I would have uh, the power to make that happen, <laughs> but uh, uh, in the meantime, I think you know uh, it's, it's remarkable, and I hope uh, uh, we put it together in a. Uh, yeah, in some sort of uh, uh, paper or booklet, or uh, because it will give the know-how uh, of, of um, uh, you know, the intervention that is needed, at, the, at least at the uh, School of Medicine level. Thank you so much. Yeah. Felipe, you can unmute yourself. Hey, thank you very much. Dr. Hame. Hey. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for doing this for us. Um, I had a question specifically about your beginnings here in the US. Um, we know that you are an immigrant. Um, my question was specifically about the language barrier, the challenges that you faced when you came and you first started practicing medicine. Um, I just, uh, I, I, have, I have this question just because uh, for my own experience, every time I, like, for example, I'm giving a short presentation to my attendings, um, sometimes I, I, I find myself uh, trying to find the words, the specific words that I want to use, and I feel like I, I, um, I have the sense that they have a picture of myself, like I said, like maybe not, not be that, that smart or uh, like a, and uh, I know that I'm capable of like uh, the same things as my peers, but I have the, the, the sense that they have this picture about uh, people who don't speak um, the language, like uh, as primary language, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can elaborate a little more about this uh, specific. Yeah, I mean, you know, in general, what, what I experienced was that um, the more sophisticated the audience, the um, less important the accent or even the grammar was. Um, so, so if you were to give a you know a grand round presentation for for a, a scientific audience, your um, yes, your your you know lack of words, uh, uh, you know limited glossary or, or or even even as I said bad grammar uh, doesn't really count. The, the the truth is that people want to uh, hear you know what you have to say so i would say at the level of you know your uh, uh, professors or your uh, uh, you know uh, or even your peers I, I i don't think that that is an issue now when it comes to patients yes of course um it's always difficult uh you, you know to communicate in another language that is not your native language and it's always, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, with with sometimes lack of uh, 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 feelings because you know you are using words that uh, do not have, you know, such a such a representation in in your mind. Um, I, I always try to be as clear as I can. I always try to you know reach out to the patients. I'm reaching out uh, with you know um, the level they can understand and 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 um and as i said uh it has been problematic sometimes sure and and um and you know but it, but you overcome that but, but but as i said being you know as much specific uh, as you can and you know making people understand that uh, uh you just happen to speak two languages uh and not just just one and that's why you are not perfect in maybe either of the two so um uh, and I think, you know, when I convey that message, I, I, I think I get the understanding that, um, yeah, what I'm trying to do is, you know, well intended and, and, and uh, um, you know, they accommodate to the um, uh, handicaps that I may have on, on my language. Um, and, and maybe they are receiving, you know, better treatment uh, just because I happen to speak two languages. So, so I, 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 again, I, I don't think at the end of the day it has been uh, problematic. Um, so, but I think, you know, the best message is, uh, um, when you are talking to an audience, uh, 
you know, the audience will go ahead and try to understand your message, no matter what you're saying. And, and no matter what, you know, language, you're, you know, barrier you, you, you have. Uh, uh, point being that, you know, the content of what you're saying is what people focuses on, uh, not the way you, you, you say it. So, and, you know, I don't know, but you probably experience the same thing. I mean, if there is someone out there that has, a, I don't know, a, a, a native language being Russian, you still want to hear the message. Uh, and, and, you know, you may suffer with the grammar, would be difficult. You know, I have sometimes problem understanding someone with, a, with, a, with an Australian accent. And, and, uh, but, uh, but if the message is important, I will, you know, go out of my way trying to, you know, understand the message. So, so it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a handicap, especially in United States. Uh, you know, I mean, we are a melting pot here of, uh, you know, different races, different languages. So I, I think I know it shouldn't be, um, uh, you know, a handicap for anybody uh, here in this country. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any other question? Um, looks like we don't have any other questions. Uh, I want to, in the name of the diversity and inclusion in the College of Medicine and Life Science, I want to thank you, Dr. Jaume, for your uh, outstanding presentation and share with us your experience. And I would like uh, to thank you to, for, to everybody who was here today and listening patiently what you need to share with us, your experience uh, in your long career as an Hispanic uh, person who came from other country and successfully are doing here in this country. This is really inspirational even for me, I am from Panama, and Thank for you. all the students that can see you as a role model to follow you in the future career. Uh, thank you for everybody to be here, and I wish for everybody a blessed day. Thank you, and that's it. I don't have anything else. Dr. Jenkins, did you have anything else? Thank you so much. This has just been inspiring, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and for everyone coming. Good night. <laughs>